Good morning, everybody. Welcome to OLC 4.0. I'm your instructor, Mike Laverty. Today is December 20th, 2022, and we are on class number 22, where we will continue our discussion of Unit 3, Lesson 12, uh, Lesson 12 and, and Lesson 13, if we get through these assignments. So hopefully going to look at assignments uh, 34 and 35 today. I'll briefly go back and touch upon assignment 33 because we almost got through it, but I want to touch upon a couple of key points, okay? So we are in week six of classes, and of course there's nine weeks in total. So we're past the halfway mark, and we're uh, cruising towards that last class, January 26th. So uh, three more classes today, including... Uh, sorry, three more classes this week, including today's, and then we're off for our two-week holiday break. So, Unit 1 and Unit 2 are, are covered, and they are all up on YouTube. So, of course, now we're... Week 6 and 7 are going to be devoted to Unit 3. I don't think we'll need all of Week 7 to get through. Unit 3, we should be on to Unit 4 by Week 7. And then we'll have plenty of time to talk about the final exam. So um, we'll spend a couple of weeks just reviewing some key concepts. And we could even start looking at some mock uh, final exams. There's tons of stuff online, too, you can find for the Ontario Literacy exam. So, which, is, which is nice because you can, you can definitely get a sense of what's going what's gonna to be on the exam. You won't actually see the questions, but you will understand what kind of questions they're going to ask you and so it's it's a mixture of reading and writing and it's there's there's no curveballs it's very consistent with what's come before in this class so you know if you're watching this on YouTube you know feel free to pause the screen and have a look at the four ways that you can participate with the class live Every Monday to Thursday from 10 to 10.55 Central Standard Time. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out the playlist. There's a Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3 playlist, and there's a Term 1B playlist that features all of the classes so far which would be, so far, be, you know, classes 1 through 21. And then after today, we'll have 1 through 22. And so again, you know, if, um, if you have any questions at this point about getting your work in, feel free to talk to your, uh, talk to your DEC, get in touch with your learning center. If you can't find anybody there, then you want to, you know, get in touch with me, or of course, anytime, you know, you want to get in touch with me. That's my number one method: is email, add me as a friend on Facebook, shoot me a Facebook message, or give me a call at one of two numbers, right? So that's our Sioux Lookout number and our toll-free long-distance number. And that's when you want to do it, okay? So, um, so this, you know, so today is the. Um, Today's the 20th, so we'll have classes tomorrow, the 21st, and classes on the 22nd. So um, I won't I won't be here um, this coming Friday because that's when the that's when the holiday breaks. But any time this week, you want to get in touch with me, Monday through Thursday, you can get in touch with me um, nine till three. So you should have read. All of the pages in Unit 1 and 2, you should have those all read. And you should be, you know, starting You should be starting to read uh, Unit 3. You know, so read those chapters um, before you watch the YouTube video, before you attend the lectures, um, or not. I, th I think it's ideal that you do. You read the material, process it write down some questions, then hopefully my lecture, my class will answer those questions. But if not, 
feel free to follow up with me. Um, so as, as a general guideline, when you're about six weeks through the course, that's, you know, a rough ballpark. You should have assignments 1 through 26 completed, done, handed in, and I should have marked them and handed them back to you. You don't want to save it all to the end and have yourself being rushed. But that's a general guideline of where I think you should be in the course. All right, so we'll have our usual words of the day. We'll look at a headline. We'll revisit assignment 33 from yesterday because we didn't quite finish it. We'll look at assignment 34 and look at assignment 35, all from unit 3. So we're going to review how writers choose their form, style, and tone. Review the writing process. And we're going to look at the writing process yet again and this time how it relates specifically to composing a journal entry. So you've written journal entries in this course before um, and and that is the, you know, a journal entry is when you reflect, when you look back and you take stock of what you've done and hopefully make a plan for what you want to do in the future. And then you're going to learn about different forms of narratives and how to format dialogue, right? So dialogue is when two or more characters are talking to each other in a play, in a book, screenplay, on TV. You know, and how do we, how do we use our words to, to write that? And how do we format that? So when we format something, we're using spacing, uh, punctuation, that kind of thing. So we'll be successful if we can identify the correct form, style, and tone to complete assignment 33. We'll be successful if we complete a journal entry uh, using the writing process. And you'll be successful if you can apply your understanding of dialogue to complete assignment 35. And I will walk you through all of that. But before we do that, we will talk about the words of the day, right? So, got a couple of quotes on the board here. We've got Paulo Freire, who, who said, Dialogue cannot exist without humility, right? Um, you know, humility. Going back, that's, that is one of the seven... Grandfather teaching. And not Han said, in true dialogue, both sides are willing to change. So two very related quotes, okay? Um, so, so a dialogue is a conversation between two people. Um, but these guys are arguing that like a true dialogue is one where both sides are willing to change. And that's, I guess this is sort of like the... Um, I guess in a way it's like the idealized or like, I don't know, even like the perfect dialogue. Something to strive for might not always happen, but, you know, in your life, if you want to have real conversations with, with people, real dialogue, um, you can't talk to them like you think you're better than them or you know better than they do. Um, and you have to have at least a little bit of willingness to change. And I think when we see a lot of online dialogue, a lot of online conversation, it's very, very one-sided. And it's just one person trying to get their view in the world. And there's no attempt to get an answer back or hear an answer back from somebody. So, and that's what a dialogue is, right? It, it, it is a give and a take. And you don't have to just believe what, what, other, what other people say. And you, and you still have to, um, you know, you still have your views and you can still think that you're right, but you have to be willing to at least listen to the other person and accept the possibility that they might be right. So we've got an Anishinaabe Moan word up on the board. So, um, so we've got uh, gaganuj, which is a noun, which is to talk to, to talk to, have a conversation with. Um, I think that should be a verb. And we've got dialogue, a noun. So a conversation between two or more people as a feature of a book, play, or a film. From the Greek, dia, which is through, 
and logos, which is word, word or reason. I think in this case, it definitely refers to word. So through words, right? And when we talk about dialogue, it's usually, usually when we talk about books, plays, or film. So these are, it's, it's usually to do with characters. There's a couple of more, uh, a few more words in the language, right? So, um, so Gaga Nuni Diwag. And again, I apologize for the pronunciation. I, I do do my best, but I realize that I quite possibly mangling some of these pronunciations, but I do strive to get them right. That's a verb. They talk to each other, have a conversation. Uh, and Dibishku is an adjective. It's just like, just like, seems like, even, equal, or directly, right? So it's an adjective with multiple meanings, but basically, um, you know, it, it, there's an equivalence. Something is equal. Two people are on even ground, right? So, and that's, you know, that word humility. Remember, we, we talked about the word humility and how it literally means the earth. Um, to be humble means to be on the ground. And, um, when you're talking to someone, you're both sitting on the same ground. You're both part of the same world. You're not above them. You're not below them. You're just existing with them, right? Two words in the English language. So we've got conversation, and that's an informal interchange of thoughts, information, etc. by spoken words, oral communication between persons from the Latin conversari, which is keep company with. And the word discussion, which is an act or instance of discussing, consideration or examination by argument, comment, etc., especially to explore solutions, uh, an informal debate from the Latin discutere, which is investigate. So um, if you were to go to somebody and you would say, I think we should have a conversation or I think we should have a discussion. I think the discussion is a little more formal. It's a little more serious. Right, so um, if you're having a conversation about something, you're just sort of ideas are going back and forth. It's a it's an interchange. Um, you know, you're exchanging thoughts. I give you my thoughts, you give me yours. But if we're having a discussion, it's a little more formal, a little more serious, and we're we're considering things, we're examining them. We're making arguments. We're doing comments. So it's not like a full-on debate, but it's uh, it's an informal debate. So important to see the distinction between the two words. Here's our article of the day from the from the Globe and Mail. So how Inuit dialysis patients and a Winnipeg doctor make, made a breakthrough for renal care in Nunavut. So we've got a photograph here, and we've got a woman, and it's, this is the caption reads, Madeline Manitok, 74, undergoes uh, peritoneal dialysis at her home in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. Home dialysis has allowed her to stay in her Nunavut uh, instead of getting treatment in faraway Winnipeg. So there's the, there is the headline broken down into the parts of speech with our um, adverbs in yellow, adjectives in orange, nouns in blue, conjunctions in purple, articles in white. Where am I? Verbs in green, prepositions in red. So we have uh, the we have this noun. Patience. But we have two adjectives that modify it, right? So they're not just any patients; they are Inuit dialysis patients, right? So. Um, 
these are specific details that help us understand what we're talking about. Okay, so they're not just any old patients. They're patients that are from a very specific uh, area of the world, and they're not just um, patients. They are patients um, who need dialysis. So how, it, you know, it, how is an adverb? It, it tells you, like, you know, how something is done. So, um, and is not a preposition. I, I made a mistake there. And is a conjunction. Article, remember there's only three articles in the English language. A, an, and the, right? So A is one of them. It's not just any doctor, it's a Winnipeg doctor, so the Winnipeg's an adjective that modifies the word noun, or modifies the noun doctor. This is what they did, made, there's another article, A, he made a breakthrough for uh, renal care, so renal, you know, to do with the kidneys, and so that, that's the special kind of care, and prepositions are uh, relationship words that tell us where something happens, when it happened, and in this case it happened in Nunavut. So there's the first three paragraphs of this article and we'll just break it down. We'll just break this article down a little bit. Um, you know, just, just going back to uh, a, a previous assignment that asks you to locate where you're from you know, where your community is, uh, you know, using a map here. So um, the Globe and Mail included this map because some people may have heard of Rankin Inlet, and I, I had certainly heard of that community, and I, but I probably couldn't put it on a map. So that's why they've done that. They've given you the map. And, they, and they've given you some key information. That it, it's 1,500 kilometers away from her home in Rankin Inlet. And we can see that, that those, those 1,500 kilometers, it's almost due north. You know, you go north and a little bit east, and then you find yourself uh, in Rankin Inlet, right? So very far away from Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, th this, this would be a similar distance from, say, you know, you know, like Fort Hope or something to Sulacal, right, where a lot of people get care. So it's, it's a similar kind of situation, right? So which is why I chose this article, right? So, so we've got an independent clause. Madeline Ma Manitok once faced a stark choice. And then we've got the, our friend the colon, right? So, which we use, and you should be doing this in your writing, we, it's to introduce an idea or ideas, right? And the idea is, um, this is her stark choice, get treatment in distant Winnipeg for the rest of her life or go without it at home. And they actually use the capital G here, which they should not have. It should just be a lowercase g. So sometimes even the professionals get it wrong, but that's I, I, copied, I copied and pasted that directly from their article. So they, that should be a lowercase g because you're not starting a new sentence, right? You could start a new sentence. You could say Madeline Manitok once faced a stark choice, um, but then you would have to preface that by, you know, she had to get treatment in distant Winnipeg. But in this case, it's a semicolon, and then you introduce the idea. Um, at the bottom here, we have additional information contained with commas. Here's how health officials got her and others in her situation a better option, right? So so we use the commas to, to separate the information, right? So. We could have done like this. We could have used brackets to separate the information. Um, and again, the, the sentence could read, here's how health officials got her a better option. That would be a fine sentence. But they want to add the additional information of the other patients, other people in her situation. So you could use a comma. You could use a dash. Right? Um, or you could rewrite the sentence, right? You could say, um, um, you could say, um, 
here's how health officials um, found a better option for her and others in her situation, right? So you, you could rephrase it a different way. So, and that's a really important concept that, uh, that I try to um, remind you of in this chorus is that there are rules in English that you have to follow, um, but there's always a different way to write a sentence, right? Um, especially when the sentence has at least five or six words to it, there's always many ways you could approach it and take it apart and rearrange it and put it in different orders. So you can always take the component parts and just rearrange them and just sort of remix them in a way. Um, but to do that, y you, can't, you can't remix or revise a sentence unless you know the rules, which is why I spend so much time um, in this course going through these sentences and looking at the different pieces, right? So you need to know what pieces can be taken apart and how to put the sentence back together. All right, when Madeline Manitok learned in 2019 that her kidneys were failing, comma, she had two choices, okay? Um, so, um, so usually when you have an int introductory word like, you know, um, you know, during the first period, comma, or, you know, when this person did that, comma, um, you know, instead of going to the mall, comma, you know, so it's, those introductory phrases are, are really useful writing tools and they set up an expectation, right? Um, so when she learned that her kidneys were failing, something, something, right? So the reader expects you to follow it up with something, you know, immediately, immediately after my surgery, comma, you know, um, something happened, right? In the second example, we've got two independent clauses joined with a conjunction. And remember, um, we can use the fanboys acronym to keep those in mind. So for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Those are the most common of the conjunctions, and they and they help us. The conjunction it, it combines. It combines two parts of a sentence. So. She could move into a hotel near a hemodialysis unit in Winnipeg for the rest of her life, right? That could be a sentence. She could return to her family in Central Nunavut and die, right? So these are these are two these are two sentences, but they've combined them together. And this is the best way to do it, right? Because it is an either or situation. This woman has a very stark choice, right? She can either do this or she can do that, right? but they're combined together um, using that comma and then the conjunction. So, the, so it's the comma and or comma but, right, or comma yet. So the comma comes first, then the conjunction, and then the clause, right? Then, then the thing that could be a, a sentence on its own, but is not. It's joined together. And here's what we're talking about today uh, in, in detail is dialogue, right? So we have a quote from the person in the story. So I found out that I couldn't go home if I wanted to live. And remember, the punctuation goes inside the quotation mark, right? You don't put it after. And, and then we got a dialogue tag or a slug. So a dialogue tag, or sometimes they call them slugs, is she said, um, she said, he said. Sometimes the writer will use like, um, you know, she yelled, she screamed, he exclaimed, you know, he, you know, th there's lots of different, he whimpered. There's lots of different ways to say it. The most common way to say it is she said. Um, you know, and, and that is the most common basic way of saying it. And so don't feel like you have to dress it up or change it. Um, usually the she said or he said um, is, is the best one. Um, so sometimes the sentence will have the quote from the person and then the tag. And then in that final example, sometimes the quote from the person will just stand as its own sentence. So I was devastated. And that just stays as itself. It's a complete sentence. And more on that in a second. Okay, so 
Yesterday, we looked at assignment 33, um, which is form, style, and tone. And you are asked to read a passage and try to figure out what it's saying. And then you're answering questions uh, that follow. And the passage we looked at was a passage about Wausau Distance Education Center. And, you know, so it's, it's cognizant of the strengths, values, and traditions passed down through the generations of First Nations people. We have honored those who have walked ahead of us. We have respect for those who walk with us and consider those yet to come. WASA encompasses the traditional education process by blending culture, tradition, information, and technology. This philosophy provides opportunities to demonstrate our commitment to the values, needs, and learning styles of our communities. Our goal is to continue developing and implementing an education system that always takes into account the next generations. We will meet the needs of the present without compromising future generations and educate the people we serve so they will succeed in the modern world. So, I will give you a little hint on the first question. So, what you're looking at here um, is either one of three things, right? So, what this is, this is, this is a corporate, this is like corporate, um, I'll put it under the heading of like c corporate communication slash uh, PR. And of course, PR stands for public relations. And so when an organization uh, communicates with the public, they're doing corporate communications. Uh, they're doing public relations because they are relating. They're relating to the public, right? They're, they're communicating a message to the public, okay? And then one way they do this is they, um, I if you go to a website, most, most websites have an about us, have an about us page, right? So this, this would be on the about us page, right? And a company will talk about their mission, their vision, and their values, okay? So their mission I is what they do what they do, who they serve, what they're trying to accomplish, and the impact they want to achieve. So your mission, you know, your mission is what you do. It, it's what you're doing right now. It's the things that you're putting money into. It's the programs you're funding. It's, you know, it's what you're doing right now. Vision is, a, is of course, uh, is where you're going or, or where you hope you're going, right? So where are we going? Um, what do we what do we want to do in the future, and what kind of future society do we envision? Right. So um, that's that's your vision statement, right? So um, so it, it's a very very different thing, right? So your mission is what you do right now, what you're trying to do right now. Vision is what you're moving towards. You know, maybe what you want to do in the future, and then your values are. Your values are not really attached to um, the past, the present, and the future. Your values kind of go through everything you do, and your values are what you stand for, the behaviors you value over all others. Um, it's how you conduct yourself, um, and it's how you're going to achieve your mission and vision. And it, it's how you treat members of your own organization and your community, right? So those, so, so that text we read about WASA. Is that a mission statement? Is it a vision statement? Is it uh, values, or is it all three, or is it two of the three? Right. So that's my that's my hint to you. Right. So what is it? So that there's a lot of is. Right. Um, they they we are this. a lot of talk about what Wasa is right now, what they're about right now, what they want to do. And then in the end, we, have, we do have talk about the future, right? So we, we will meet this. We will do that, right? Um, 
And so there's, there's a bit of discussion about what, what WASA is doing now. There's a discussion of what they want to do in the future. And do we have talk about values in here? So ask yourself that question. So here's another organization, uh, the Sulakaut uh, SLIFNA, which of course stands for the Sulakaut First Nations Health Authority. Um, and this is from their website. That's from SLIFNA's website. And their mission statement is that SLIFNA, uh, their mission statement is they transform the health of Anishinaabe people across Kiwetanuk by providing community-led services and a strong voice for their community needs. That's what they do right now. Their, their, vision, is, uh, their vision is to have resilient uh, and health nations supported on their path to wellness. Okay, that's what they want to see happen in the future. And their values are they respect relationships, culture, equity, and fairness. They work to protect the Anishinaabe teachings of love, courage, respect, wisdom, truth, honesty, and humility. So, of course, the seven grandfather teachings. So, that's on their website. That's their official statement. They have a mission statement, values, and vision. TikTok, according to their website, has a vision. Um, it's now available in 150 markets, 75 languages. So a place where everybody belongs, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic levels, and offers a vibrant, buzzing atmosphere that celebrates trends and embraces diversity. TikTok has become a marketplace for ideas around the globe, transcending boundaries to create a diverse hub of content, right? So that's their statement to the world. Um, these things may or may not be true. Of course, they want it to be true. So that, that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that uh, public relations and corporate communications, they are, in a sense, advertising. You are presenting the best version of yourself. So you have to kind of keep that in mind when you read somebody's statement. Um, but it, it's a way to keep people accountable, right? If somebody says, this is our vision, and they're doing stuff that's not consistent with that vision, you can kind of call them on it. These are Google's values. Um, they focus on the user. Focus on the user and all else will follow. It's best to do one thing really, really well. It's kind of ironic because Google does everything. Uh, fast is better than slow. Democracy on the web works. You don't need to be at your desk to need an answer. You can make money without doing evil. There's always more information out there. The need for information crosses all borders. You can be serious without a suit, and great isn't good enough. Great isn't great just isn't good enough. All right, so going back to that WASA uh, statement, what's the form of that piece of writing? And that's the form, right? So form is the, you know, is the type. Form is the type. It's the pattern. It's the genre. What is it, right? So it's a very specific type or form of writing. So what is it? Now what's the style of the writing? Is it formal? Is it informal? What's the tone? It, what, was it serious? Was it casual? And why? And when you answer the why, you need to cite the text, okay? So cite the text. You know, quote it. Quote it or paraphrase it. That's the best way you can tell me why you think something is a certain way. Okay, purpose. Why was that statement written? Okay, so what's the purpose of that statement? Well, wh who is the audience for that piece of writing? Okay, and do you think the form, style, and tone of the writing are appropriate to the audience you identified in question five? Explain your answer. So I'm hoping what I just said the last 10 minutes or so will speak to this assignment and, and let you know how to answer that, okay? There are several words in the writing that you may not be familiar to you. So what you're doing is you're finding five of those words uh, and then you find out their meaning, okay? So use any and every uh, resources you have, you can. So choose five words 
and, and then give me the meaning of those words, right? So, so that's up to you. So, we go back to our wasa. Try to figure the most unusual words here. So, cognizant, that's uh, not used in everyday speech, not too often. Um, so cognizant might be one you might want to look up and find out the meaning of encompass. Um, philosophy, like you may, you may have heard the word philosophy, but do you know what it means, right? Uh, Phil means to love. Sophie means wisdom, so it literally means to love wisdom, but what does it really mean in this context? And if, if you can't find five words that you didn't know, like maybe you knew all these words, just pick five words and, and, and then research their definition. Trust me, it's always useful to do that, okay? Um, you know, implementing, compromising, or com uh compromising so look up those words and write down the definition okay on to assignment 34 so this is a journal entry so your subject um, so you're choosing a subject an audience a style and a tone and a purpose okay so so you're not choosing them you get to choose your style and your tone and the content, but uh, the subject of this journal entry is how important, or not, you feel it is to reflect on what you learn as you go through this course. You may think journal entries, reflections, are a complete waste of time because you are not really a assessing your skills as you go along, or perhaps you have not set any goals, so you are not meeting them. Then again, you may think that this journaling business is quite handy, because it allows you to demonstrate and discuss your personal growth in reading and writing. Okay, so it can go either way. Um, so you have to reflect upon your 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 um, reflect upon what you've learned in this course, um, and then you're reflecting upon journal entries themselves. So you're doing a, a reflection upon reflection, right? So you're talking about the process of looking back on your pro your progress and saying, you know. Has this been useful to me? Why or why not? Okay. So your purpose is to inform your audience how important or not you feel it is to reflect on your own goals and your growth in literacy. Your audience is your teacher, myself, and you can choose your tone and your style. Okay. So, so you're letting me know. how you feel about this issue one way or the other, okay? So, um, so of course, we'll talk about the writing process. So, step one, we plan. We create an outline. So, we need to, um, we need to agree or disagree that um, reflecting I'll say we're reflecting on our progress as readers and writers is useful okay so so f step one so do you agree or disagree um, and then I, w I would argue that you should go like um, and then list of reasons why so in point form you know, you, you, 
I want you to jot down some reasons why you either disagree or agree with that statement. That reflecting on our progress as readers and writers is useful. So I, I of course, agree with the statement, and, and I've seen it. Um, and I, I'm going to say, you know, in, in point form, you know, it allows it allows me to monitor my progress and my inner thoughts, right? That's So it's like, you know, a benchmark. Um, you know, reflecting upon your progress is useful in that way because it allows me to make a record of how I was thinking at a certain time and what my attitudes were like. Um, and then I, w you know, me personally, you know, I have... I've seen the benefits of doing this. I think it is a very useful exercise. Um, okay. Um, and then maybe one more here. So, mm, let's go with. So I've monitored my progress. I have seen the benefits of self-reflection. And then one more reason why I believe it's a useful exercise is that it um, helps generate ideas and also helps me to find maybe find areas to improve upon. And so these are and again these are like general, right? So these these are these is like a general uh list of reasons why and then what I can do is I can find specific examples, right? So um what you see on the board here are general they're general topics these are general topics or ideas um, so if I wrote you know I have seen the benefits of self-reflection um, maybe I would say like for example right so these are going to be like prompts these are going to be starters right these are these are going to help me right so these are general topics or ideas. Um, I'm going to use them as sentence starters, okay? So I'm going to use all of these points as, uh, as sentence starters to kind of get me rolling, to get me moving along, right? So... As, as I complete this assignment, right? So, um, and I, I don't have time to talk about the full writing process with you, but Step two. Step two is when I write, and then I, and then what I'm going to do is here is I'm going to write. Um, I'm going to write an opening sentence, which will be my topic, right? And this will be based on if I agree or disagree, right? 
So I'm going to do that. And then I'm also going to write... Um, I'm going to write at least one sentence for each for each reason why so for every reason why I'm gonna write at least one sentence okay and that's gonna give me a lot of raw material to work with and then once I have that raw information then I'll move on to step three of the revision process where I'll try to rearrange those pieces, try to find a general theme, right? Um, you know, try to try to find a, a way that I can attack the problem, right? So, and that's and and that and that that process is really helpful, I find. It, it, that one, two, three, at least to get started, right? So, and then. And then step three, when I go on to the revision process, you know, I will look I will look at all my sentences and then I will find I'll find a theme or a main idea and then I will rearrange my ideas. And then once I've done that, I'll, I'll probably go back and do a bit more writing. So that, that's, that's usually the way it goes, right? So you, you, you make a plan you make an outline. That outline helps you get some initial writing done. Once the initial writing is done, you go on to step three and you make some revisions. So you look at what you've got, you try to find some ideas, you try to make some connections, you rearrange the pieces, and then usually you go back to the writing, generate some more ideas, do a bit more revision, and then once you feel you've got enough there and it's more or less in the right order, then you go on to the editing process and then you edit what you have and you try to make it sharper and stronger and then once the initial editing's out of the way you might write a bit more you might do a bit more revision so but you kind of you, you go forward backwards forwards backwards in the writing process right it's rarely ever just a one two three four five and done It's usually a multi multi step process. Okay, so let's jump into assignment thirty five. We'll, we'll 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 do as much of this as we can, in t until tomorrow's class, wh where we'll finish it off in full. So, so assignment assignment number thirty five is is asking you to uh, look at fiction and nonfiction. So you're we're looking at narratives, right? So. Um, so these these are narratives, okay? And a narrative is a, is a, is a is a story that's told. So we're looking at nonfiction and fiction narratives. And the first exercise is asking you to punctuate dialogue and direct quotations. And if you go to the, the unit material, you've got a dozen rules, minus three. Uh, uh, it's a page that helps you punctuate the following dialogue. Um, so when we're formatting dialogue, we're, we're using spacing, we're using punctuation, and we're using capitalization, right? So we'll just delve into that a little bit, okay? Want to give you a couple examples, okay? From from that uh, from that guideline. So, so a divided quotation is when you've quoted somebody but you've split it up. 
The first word of the second part is not capitalized unless it begins a new sentence. So this soup, the elder said, tastes just like my kokums, right? So in, in this example, we have um, the full quote reads, this soup tastes just like my kokums, but that quote is divided, right? It's a, it's a divided quotation. So let's pay attention to the formatting here. So the comma goes inside the quotation mark. So it's comma, then the quotation mark. The elder said, right? So that's my, that is my dialogue tag or slug, okay? Another comma, and then lowercase t, tastes just like my kokums, right? And again, we've got the period first, and then the quotation mark comes on the outside of the punctuation. When writing only a part of a quoted sentence, you know, when you're doing a research essay, for example, do not begin the quotation with a capital letter unless the person you are quoting capitalized it or it's the first word of your sentence, okay? So in this case, um, what we're doing is we're, this is an integrated quote. This is when a quote is inside of our writing. So Robert Chekwich admitted he had not found many novels that were based in First Nation communities, right? So in this case, his words and my words as the writer are being fused together. But his words are put in quotation marks so we know that, um, you know, and that's the whole point of the quotation mark, right, is my words are underlined and his words are in the quotation marks, right? But you can, you can, f but you so it's one sentence that has his words and my words together, but that's how you do that. So you don't capitalize the word that. It, that's still a lowercase t. Unless if the quote started with a capitalized letter, then you would capitalize it. But in this case, it's just a part of a quote. When you write dialogue, um, begin a new paragraph whenever the speaker changes. Okay, so that's um, so I if you read if you read a screenplay, for example, it'll actually say the character's name. You know, like Randy, and then a line of dialogue, and then Judy, and then a, r a line of dialogue. When you're when you're writing down fiction, or when you're writing down quotes of people. Um, you always skip down, so there's always an empty space here, right? There's that empty space in between. And that tells the reader that somebody else is talking. And then one of the, one of the best reasons they do this is you avoid, um, because it, it does get repetitive to have he said, she said, he said, she said. If there's just two people talking, you don't have to include the he said, she said. You can if you want, but you don't have to. Um, the, the space and then the new paragraph that starts tells the reader that we have a speaker change. There's a new speaker. So, um, so that's one way you have to format your dialogue when you write it. So every new paragraph, right, is, is a new speaker, right? So... Even if it's just two speakers, right? Every 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 paragraph is a new one. Use a pair of dashes to indicate an abrupt break in thought or speech or an unfinished statement. First of all, he said, if you can learn a simple trick, son, you'll get along better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Huh? Until you walk two moons in his moccasins, right? So, so this dash right here, um is where somebody you know they stopped this is where they stopped talking or they were interrupted or they trailed off or something right 
And that's how we indicate that they were either interrupted, they stopped talking, or they trailed off. There's a space. We've got a new speaker here. Okay? So that's where we'll end things off today. We'll come back tomorrow and we'll finish off assignment uh, 35 and move on to the rest of the assignments in Unit 3. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you tomorrow.